Impact Hustlers, the podcast on entrepreneurs and change makers that are creating solutions to the world's biggest problems. Impact Hustlers is brought to you by Fast Forward 2030 and Real Changers. Visit fastforward2030.com to learn how to include the global goals into your business model and realchangers.com to find talent and careers with impact. And this is your host, Michael Shafra. This is Impact Hustlers, the podcast on the entrepreneurs that solve the world's biggest social and environmental problems. And I'm your host, Michael Schaffrath. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. If you like this episode, make sure to subscribe, leave a review and share the episode, most importantly, with a friend. To keep updated on new episodes, visit impacthustlers.com and sign up for our email alerts. And follow us on Twitter as well at Impact Hustlers. Enjoy today's episode and let's go. In today's episode, I speak to Dan Gregg, founder and CEO of Global OTEC Resources. Based in Newquay, Cornwall in the United Kingdom, Dan was inspired by Sir David Attenborough's Frozen Planet movie, which led him to take action on the climate crisis. OTEC Resources uses a technology that utilizes the energy absorbed from the sun by oceans. It uses warm surface water to power a turbine that can provide energy for remote island resorts or local communities in developing countries. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you very much for having me. It's an honor. Thanks for joining me. You're actually a great example. I just mentioned before for the Attenborough effect. <laughs> um, there's something called the Attenborough effect where people stop buying plastic bags because of documentaries, which are obviously very influential. But for you, it had an effect in terms of watching one of his documentaries and then deciding I need to do something in this space and kind of help in this space. And you actually started out with desalination. Yes, initially. that's right. So tell us the story of how everything started for you, how you started from this moment of I need to do something to figuring out, okay, desalination is not the most common thing you come across every day. So how did you take that journey and then how did you end up with your current company? Sure. Well, I guess going back to where that Attenborough effect moment took place, it was maybe five or six years ago now. And as you say, I was uh, deeply inspired by one of David Attenborough's Frozen Planet films. It was episode seven on thin ice, I believe. It documented the ice sheets uh, receding, and I found it such a moving and powerful piece of film. And I had what I guess is a bit of a, maybe a cliche epiphany moment where I felt I needed to leave my job, which was a very secure job, a successful fashion retailer, and I wanted to work full-time, figuring out how I could have some sort of impact, no matter how small, against climate change. So I started researching desalination technology. I can't quite recall what got me to that technology, but I was really interested in how to produce clean water through sustainable means. A lot of the world's reverse osmosis plants are fossil fueled, uh, very inefficient, and that seemed like an area that was ripe for disruption. On that journey, I met a owner of a resort in Zanzibar. This came about because I was turning up at trade events at the Excel in London or at the Olympia, networking my way around the room in any way I could to try and get some traction with people who wanted to help on my mission. So this gentleman agreed to give me 70 meters squared of land at his resort in Zanzibar to build a prototype in exchange for the potable water that would provide. So I went away and continued trying to work on the prototype design. And while learning about the various desalination methods, I found myself going down a rabbit hole of all things OTEC, which stands for Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion. And it was one of those things where I couldn't believe that more people weren't talking about OTEC. Quite rightfully, for the last few decades, people have waxed lyrical about solar, wind, biogas, electric cars, batteries, wave, tidal. Why are your listeners here? Why have they never heard of OTEC yeah. until today? It's the first time I heard of it, to be honest, when you approached me. And you'll be forgiven. <laughs> yeah. You'll be forgiven. <laughs> um, so I 
obviously it wasn't as sexy as solar and wind because it is a bit further from mass adoption or even being ready for the market. But the more that I researched OTEC, the more I understood its potential in being actually quite close to, to being commercial. But nobody was working on it in the way that I envisioned. Hmm. So because of this gentleman in Zanzibar that owned a resort, I saw an application for a small scale OTEC system that could generate electricity for these off-grid resorts that would completely negate their need for fossil fuels to produce clean water, air conditioning, lighting, kitchens, refrigeration. Resorts have very unique profiles in that they're in often very remote places and have to attain a very high standard for the luxury that they want to provide their guests. And we have geopolitical tensions, which always seem to be a relevant news story. Resorts are at the mercy of volatile oil prices, so they have a limited security of supply. If something major happened in a certain part of the world that stopped their oil imports, then the resorts wouldn't have a business. So I continued with my OTEC curiosity and started working on a renewable energy project with a sort of crazy academic guy. And that's where I met my co-founder, not the crazy academic guy, a gentleman that had invested in this guy. So we kind of grew frustrated with this guy's lack of leadership and progress. So mm. we jumped ship after a couple of months mm. and we formulated a new concept for OTEC, profiled a large amount of market interest, starting with focus on, on those resorts for the reasons I just mentioned. And then we started pitching to engineering firms in the hope that someone would be inspired by us and would be willing to work for free or for very little, which I'm sure is a, yeah. a relevant challenge for a lot of the people that mm. you speak to. Mm. After a lot of pitches, we did find a team that had decades of experience in oil and gas, but wanted a fresh start in renewables. Mm. And they were willing to do some pro bono work in exchange for some securities in the bigger picture of our company. So mm. we went off and started pitching for money and endured hundreds of rejections until a fund in Cornwall awarded us our first £140,000. Mm. That was in September 2018. And that allowed us to hire and pay that technical team full time. Mm. And then we were awarded a further 80000 in April of this year from the same fund. To That's given us a runway now to complete a seed round and start to build on the detailed design of our concept. So it's so quite, quite a long-winded answer, oh. but I think yeah, I no, tried so to cover it all off. Yeah. Did you end up moving to Zanzibar for a bit to kind of test everything or how did you do it? <laughs> I wish. You know, we were a lot earlier yeah. in progress there. So I wish I had got to spend some time in Zanzibar. I've been quite lucky to spend some time actually in the Maldives. Mm. You know, there's a lot you can do from a computer now that 20, 30 years, no one was empowered or liberated to mm. do. So I was able to do a lot of that proof of concept work on the mm. desalination project by... Skype calling postgrads at MIT in the US and speaking to people who had a lot of experience mm. in the field, people at General Electric. So there was a lot I could do because I don't come from a privileged background mm. or rich parents. I couldn't afford really to just jump on a plane to Zanzibar. Yeah, so, you know, really it, it all started on my parents' yeah. dining table, myself and my and laptop, hustling. and, uh, you know, we took it from there. Amazing. I mean, in general, starting an energy company is a massive endeavor in any case. And I think you don't have personally a technical background, but you found your technical co-founder. So how did that journey go from, you know, idea to actually seeing, okay, I can actually do this. You know, even if I don't have all the knowledge required, I can actually, you know, call up all these experts and I can get a co-founder that kind of brings in some of the expertise that you might not have. How did that journey go? It was tough. There were a lot of sacrifices along the way. As I said, I had a well-paid, secure job in my mid-twenties. I had a huge friendship group and I had to systematically sacrifice everything. Mm. Not in an instance, but gradually over time. So first, I had to get my story straight. I had to explain to people why I was leaving my job mm. and kind of pass their BS test as to what I was talking about. So I had been studying desalination in my mornings and evenings, mm. either side of my full-time job. And I was, as I said, conference calling people at MIT. And I think I have a bit of a 
quite a bold personality quite naturally that I don't hesitate before calling someone mm. up. And perhaps that comes from a bit of a sales and marketing background. Mm. You know, I've worked, I've got rid of my gremlins around cold calling and just contacting people out of the blue, which I think might hold some people back who are quite technical. And I think the way the technical founding team, the way that I had attracted them was we had a complementary skill set where they a very technical had been working on huge oil and gas projects over the last few decades and they had started out their own engineering consultancy but felt that there was perhaps a gap on the marketing and product development side mm. and you know that's been my background and although I've always been slightly technical but in more of a software sense with my background we managed to get on very well and the relationship kind of blossomed quite quickly. So I think it's about finding people with complementary skill sets who can cover your blind spots and vice versa. And then you've got a nice cohesive team where there aren't any skill gaps. And really the things started to take off for us with mm. grants and investors once we had nailed that team. And, you know, it, it was a three, four year process. It mm. did not happen overnight. No, of course. So once you had the team, you had a bit of money in the bank from those investors. How did you go about it? You had a bit of prototype work done already. How are you set up now? How did you develop the product? And how are you still testing your concept? Yeah. So, you know, I think we started off by looking at a lot of the academic papers or that have already been published around OTEC. And it's clear that there had been a lot of progress in technology in the last 50 years. If you read some of the early studies about OTEC back in the 70s, I think it's OTEC 1 and Mini OTEC, their projects used asbestos seals and had ammonia leaks. And it was a complete disaster. Luckily, nobody was killed. But OTEC was proved as a concept at time back in 1970. So there was a lot of groundwork that's already been done in this field. And I think it was a case of leveraging a pool of technical skills that could speak to the different relevant areas. So there are very few people who have a lot of experience in the field of OTEC. And we're very lucky to partner with someone who brings a lot of value in that respect. And then identifying the unique challenges in developing OTEC for an off-grid resort where you need a floating structure, we needed to fill the technical gap using naval architects and structural engineers that had a lot of experience mm. in the offshore sector. So it was a case of finding a collaborative group of technical people that could bring the concept to bear. So once we raised that initial funding, we had had enough groundwork in place based on the prior proof of concepts for OTEC, and we started building on that. So with that first grant fund, we established a full-time small team down in Newquay. And as I'm sure a lot of your listeners are aware, small teams can achieve a lot more than bigger teams mm -hmm. in challenging periods of time. So we set a relatively broad but clear vision of what they needed to achieve in a six-month time frame. We had an oceanographer, a mechanical engineer, and a project manager, all who's still working for us. They're amazing guys. Really, they absolutely nailed the concept design mm. to the point that we've now been able to go and nearly complete a seed round, mm. take us to the next level. Next level. Amazing. Let's talk a bit about technology and you already mentioned there's actually a few advantages over solar let's say right yes if i'm a resort somewhere maybe i don't have much space so i either have to put the solar cells like on my roof if i can or kind of buy more land to put solar there i guess and your technology is actually floating on the ocean so you don't actually take space away from the land mass as such so how does it actually work you pump some liquids through some pipes. Would and you like, a, would you like some... an OTEC 101? Please, please. <laughs> <laughs> so as I mentioned earlier, OTEC stands for Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion. And it's similar to a, a heat engine cycle, which is quite a commonplace cycle that I think some technical people would be familiar with. So it creates power using a temperature differential. So with OTEC, you use the warm surface water, which is about 27 degrees all year round and cold deep water from far below sea level that's maintained at about four degrees all year round and that temperature differential 
powers an array of heat exchangers. Let me explain what that means. So the warm water first flows into a heat exchanger that evaporates a working fluid, like ammonia. So if you think of a heat exchanger, like a radiator, you have two chambers. Warm water is pumped into one side, and that ambient heat is transferred into the working fluid, which becomes a vapor. That vapor is processed into the generator and spins a turbine, which we then we have our product that we sell to the off taker. And then the cold deep water, which is the most challenging part of any floating OTEC plant, acts as a heat sink for that vapor. So we need to return that vapor back into a liquid state. So in another heat exchanger, which is the condenser, we pump in the cold water. We drop the vapor down, which is then cooled back into a liquid form. And then that is pumped back into the evaporator. And that's a cycle that completes 24 hours a day, 52 weeks a year. So it is unique compared to solar and wind. You know, there are no major daily temperature or, or seasonal temperature fluctuations. You don't need battery storage like with solar or a hybrid diesel system, which is what we're most against. We want to eradicate the use of diesel across yeah. the tropics. So this works day and night then with the temperatures or is it mainly doing the That's day right. that produce energy? You're talking about masses of ocean water. The sun rising and setting does not affect the surface temperature water. Across a season, you may see a fractional fluctuation, maybe between two to three degrees centigrade, mm-hmm. but this isn't something that will impact the operation of the system. Mm-hmm. And then you initially starting still with resorts, pretty much. They are kind of a good beachhead segment in the most literal way, I guess, to attack first and then spread out from there. How do you see it in the longer run? I think you would mentioning before that you know many developing economies can actually benefit from this how do you see yourself this being applied to different contexts and a resort for example in the future yeah i mean well to start with our core markets we've identified just for context are spending mm. six billion dollars on diesel fuel for energy generation wow. every year mm. and solar and storage in its current form is not a viable solution for hundreds, if not thousands, of those islands. They simply don't have the space. And like you say, unless they want to have solar on top of every rooftop and also dredge more land to have a bigger solar panel installation, it's simply something that's not viable. So we look at the resorts as our first way into that market. Mm. But if you want to know about the wider picture of mm. OTEC, mm. the world has something like 30 terawatts of potential OTEC capacity stored in its oceans. So right now, there are 30 terawatts that aren't being used. And for comparison, the UK's capacity that it needs to run is something like 50 gigawatts. Mm. So that's 0.16% of the world's OTEC potential could be powering the UK. So there's a significant resource out there The challenge is that you need a relatively unique geography, which the markets we've identified in the tropics meet that. And we believe, you know, we're we're starting with this small scale application, but our broader scope is how can we leverage this clean energy for everywhere in the world? Mm. But we have to start in the tropics where, where it is most viable to design and run a system. Amazing. What's the biggest challenge for this technology reaching scale? And maybe what do you see as some of the reasons why maybe the big energy companies haven't done this yet or have they done it? Do you do you feel that could it become a threat to you at some point? Or what's kind of the thing that needs to be figured out until mm. this can be really scaled and well applied? I do think we have an upper hand, and I would. Others have tried before, and that there is sort of lingering competition from companies with much higher budgets than us but a lot of the focus in the past has been on building 10 megawatt plants Mm. you know that 30 terawatt number i think might be a red herring for some people to think you know we need to scale quicker to you know starting with 10 megawatts that's going to yield quite an attractive unit cost in the economics of the system but unfortunately a lot of all of those projects now have been shelved so you know neither the technology or the finance to make those plants viable was available. And it's worth mentioning 
The largest grid connected OTEC plant in the world right now is 100 kilowatts. So a jump from 100 kilowatts to 10 megawatts is a massive leap. And these 10 megawatt plants require hundreds of millions of dollars in capital. So it's not a simple R&D project for a company whose core business is an OTEC. Mm. So our first system is going to have an output of 1.5 megawatts. So you're still considerably higher than 100 kilowatts, but considerably lower than 10. It will actually have a capacity of 3 megawatts, but we have pumps and other onboard systems to run. We don't want to use auxiliary diesel generators to run those, but we will have 1.5 megawatts of capacity. Mm. So unlike the 10 megawatt plants that other people have tried before, we won't have that massive attraction of a very low unit cost so it's a prototype Mm. we our expectations are managed and we're very realistic about the challenges that come with that so i think others haven't tried before when they've approached this problem is to not worry too much about having a higher unit cost Mm. at the start now we can afford to have a high unit cost because we're not supplying a grid that has economies of scale we have an off-grid resort that has very high energy costs and a risk of a a risky security of supply for the energy. Hmm. So our goal with the first system is just to undercut or match the upper bound cost of diesel. So the investment banks will look at all the energy sources and they'll give a lower bound and an upper bound estimation of what those costs. And for diesel, that's something like 21 cents per kilowatt hour, up to 28 cents per kilowatt hour so with our prototype instead of trying to compete with solar which a lot of bigger companies have tried to do before we're just going to match or undercut that 28 cents per kilowatt hour and then once we've successfully proved that concept with a more organized production manufacturing chain we'll be able to then beat that lower number below 20 cents and we're confident that we'll be able to challenge rooftop solar then as well Amazing. That's a great journey to see where you've come from. I got two last questions. One is, what's your biggest learning so far from this whole journey? Maybe it's something you can share with other entrepreneurs that have similarly ambitious projects. What have you learned through all this? Okay, that's a good question. I think one of the best lessons that I've had out of this that are relevant for a lot of your listeners who I understand will be on an early stage as part of their journey and this isn't something that I'm saying uniquely, it's it's an approach to minimizing risk. So before I quit my job, and I'm assuming a lot of people listening to this may be still in their jobs with this as a side hustle or something part-time, they're very passionate about taking full-time. So before I quit my job, I started pitching to people in my professional network um, to give me freelance work. I kind of told them a bit of the story, gave them some context, so they were slightly inspired to want to help. But that was a really key point in stopping me from going broke. Because if I had saved up a few months wages just to see it out for a few months, I would have run out of money and I would have ended up back in a full-time job. So I think you hear a lot about the freelance transition these days. I think if you're in a full-time job and you want to get into running your own business and doing something powerful, making change, owning your time and how you manage your time is the first step. And it also teaches you very valuable business skills because as a freelancer, you are your own business. Such an important lesson, I think, and just to underline your point here, I think a lot of the articles about entrepreneurship it always seems like, oh yeah, just leave your job, make your dreams come true, jump in, all in, right? Where well, you need to be pragmatic, right? Like if you don't have a million in your bank account already from because you inherited it or whatever, mm. uh, you need to find practical ways of making it yeah. happen. And it's great to hear it from you too, that you went that way and got a bit of freelance work so you could actually dedicate a lot of your time into this project. That's Can I add another advice. point? Cause Absolutely, I've kind of got yeah. to It's another point within minimizing risk. So I think anyone who is in the space of change making has to start with grants. There is a lot of funding in the world for sustainable projects and projects that want to have a positive impact in line with the UN Sustainable Development Goals at the moment. Whether you're pitching for a a thousand pounds, ten thousand pounds, a hundred thousand pounds, there are so many sources out there. Mm. I think if you've got a strong idea and a strong story, you will get funding eventually. If you think our idea is strong, well, 
it was three years before we got our first grant. So you've got to have patience and you've got to be willing to tough it out. But I think the value of pitching for grants and to investors at an early stage gives you feedback on your idea and it can help prevent any blind spots that you might have on developing that. Mm, amazing. We already reached the end, but let me ask you the last famous question, and that's how does the world look like in 10 years if you succeed with your company? What's the type of world you'd like to create? With in it? the next 10 years, we will have over 100 OTEC plants around the world generating energy, clean energy, using the ocean thermal. It's not the silver bullet for the challenges that the world has at the moment, but it's an important part for places in the world to eradicate CO2 emissions from their islands. Amazing. And what can people do to support you, to help you? What do you need the most? Are you looking for people to join work with you, investors, both of it, I guess? <laughs> I think a bit of everything. You know, we're just so willing and interested in talking to people who want to be supportive. I would say anyone who's interested in talking to me directly, my Twitter handle is at Dan Grech, that's G-R-E-C-H. Our company handle on Twitter is Otec Resorts, that's O-T-E-C Resorts. I think just engage with us, promote us, talk to other people and spread the word of ocean thermal energy conversion. Amazing. Thanks so much for sharing your journey. You're and welcome. I wish you all the best. Thank for you for your time. Years to come. Let's Thanks. catch up in a year. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you liked this episode, make sure to subscribe, leave a review, and share the episode with a friend. To keep updated on new episodes, visit impacthustlers.com and sign up for our email alerts. And also follow us on Twitter at Impact Hustlers. Thanks very much for tuning in and see you next week. This was Impact Hustlers, the podcast on entrepreneurs and change makers that are creating solutions to the world's biggest problems. Impact Hustlers is brought to you by Fast Forward 2030 and Real Changers. Visit fastforward2030.com to learn how to include the global goals into your business model and realchangers.com to find talent and careers with impact.